My next guest is Stephanie Ryan. Stephanie is, um, has worked and taught science to all age groups, both in and out of the classroom. She's helped toddlers learn about their world and college students define theirs. She is an active member of the chemistry education community and is currently a committee member of the International Activities Committee for the Division of Chemical Education. Stephanie earned her PhD in the learning sciences and her MS in analytical chemistry from the University of Illinois at Chicago. She earned her BS in chemistry from St. Mary's College. Welcome to the podcast, Stephanie. Thanks so much for having me. So tell me about a time when you were in the trenches and managed to cry. So when I was taking time off to have my son and I was revisiting all of the concepts that he goes through from a different age group. So I am a chemist, right? And I teach and it was so complicated to help explain things to such a younger person. Um, and so I would sit and I would try to reframe my thoughts of how it would be if you didn't know anything about this world, mm -hmm. if you were a, truly a blank slate how would you explain things? And that is really tricky to do. So that is something that I sat and I really very much so spent a lot of time on this was how can I simplify concepts that are tricky for adults to be more for the public or more for kids? And it was something that I get feedback on. So I will go and read books to kids and the questions I ask them, sometimes they're duds and I get nothing from the kids. And they all just kind of look at me like, wow, that analogy didn't work or I have yeah. no idea what you're talking about. And then there are times when they give me answers that totally change the way I'm going to ask the question next time. And mm -hmm. so the way I got through all of that was just being adaptable um, and never having a set curriculum in my head of what I'm going through. Like, how am I going to explain this to a child? How am I going to explain this to a classroom of students? I'm not coming in with the set lesson plan of it must go this way. I really yeah. feed off of the students and it's almost like improv. Um, I, I hear something and I just completely switch what I'm doing in the moment. You have to be reflexive. Um, and so that is how I got through that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, you know, if you taught a long time in secondary level or college level, and then when you have your own child and um, you're seeing kind of how they interpret the world, I think that's that whole new experience myself also having taught for a long time and then having kids and, you know, uh, seeing um, how younger kids learn is, a, is an experience, right? So yeah, thanks for sharing. So uh, so you work a lot with uh, science education, and um, I, I, we have a variety of different topics I wanted to discuss around learning science. So one of the things is uh, learning together with your family and um, kind of kitchen science tips, or um, you could even kind of uh, mix, mixed chemistry in the mix. So uh, especially as we're recording this in the summer and uh, whether your child's you know toddler or middle or high school age, how can you maybe incorporate kitchen into science for your family? Yeah, so that was another trench that I was thinking about was um, during the pandemic, uh, being at home with your kid and you were like, what am I going to do with them? And so <laughs> I thought I'm going to do science. And so I sat yeah. down and we did very rigid science experiments and my son was bored and he was like, I don't want to do this. This doesn't look like fun. Um, yeah. And it was the approach. And so the advice I give parents of kids in the summer on breaks, whatever, is approach it from the, their lens and what they want. So if your kid really likes bugs, approach it from bugs. Like yeah. if you go out in the garden and say like, dig a hole and see if you could find five insects. Um, you could talk about differences between spiders and insects, and you could have them do an art project that goes along with it. You can do these themed packs that don't have anything to do with you buying a science kit that's expensive. Um, and so, like you said, with kitchen chemistry, one of my goals is to do things you already have around the house and kind of yeah. point out the science that's around you. Um, 
there's just a lot of stuff you can do with baking soda and vinegar. Um, you can add baking soda and vinegar in a dish and a toddler goes bananas. They look at it and they're just like, whoa, look at those bubbles. And then they, they will on their own without you asking them, they will test rate of reaction without calling it that. They'll pour vinegar in different amounts. They'll smash the mm -hmm. baking soda down to see if the surface area changes. They don't know they're doing that. That's just part of their natural curiosity. Yeah. And so you can build on those by saying, you know, like to an older kid, well, what's happening there? You've got solids, liquids, and gas. Like, and how can you prove there's a gas? Well, you could have a bottle with a balloon on top and the balloon will blow up with the gas proving that there's a gas there. Um, things like that. So you can use things around your house or existing things are science. So like I said, a garden, you could plant mm -hmm. a seed and watch it grow every day. Talk about what it needs. Put one in a shaded area and one in a sunny area and see how that goes. Um, it's just there's so many things around us that we forget our science. <laughs> and it's my goal to show parents that you don't really have to go too far from your comfort zone to do these things. And as a parent, you know, I've seen like you have those kits um, and like I, my um, ch children that are going into ninth and seventh grade, um, had a couple of these kits I got for Christmas and then uh, my my daughter just started using that kit like and now she's watching how the rocks change in the science kit but those are the things that might be laying around <laughs> too right and kids haven't like looked at right but now wow they're fascinated because they 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 started you know the experiment <laughs> so yeah <it's> like... <laughs> well and with young kids you're not necessarily doing an experiment like yeah. in the true sense of the word you're just keeping the wonder there but also having them ask questions and justify their claims with evidence um talking mm -hmm. through what they're seeing and teaching them to make better observations um but something as simple as one of our favorite things to do, um, and I, my husband calls me a nerd every time we do this on a Sunday morning, is uh, we like to make parfait patterns. Okay. And what I do is, you know, A, B, A, B patterns like that in math, um, or A, A, B, B, you use beads a lot in the pre-K and K to do those. Um, we do it with food. And so we get out whatever ingredients we have in the pantry. So sometimes there are raisins, sometimes it's popcorn and you yeah. have yogurt and you label each ingredient. And then you ask your child to write out the pattern they want to do. And they make their own parfait with the different layers. And then they have okay. to stop when they run out of one of them to show that the ratio of them also has to be the same. And so okay. that's math. And if you're not an educator, you're like, oh, wow, that is math, you know, like that is something that is just in around you and your kid can recognize these patterns. So it doesn't have to be a kit like that. It could just be something you do making cookies, a recipe. Like I only have one egg instead of two eggs. How many cookies can we make? Things like that. And that leads into what I was going to discuss next. next. So you say on social media, you list different kinds of experiments that you can do with um, items that you already have at home. Uh, what are some other ideas um, of just these materials that might not be often used, that might not be food? They could just be, um, like you said, things you find in a garden or just things lying around the house. Yeah, so um, I know during the pandemic, a lot of people had yeast laying around because they were okay. making different breads. Um, so you can do yeast with sugar. And the reaction that occurs there, how they produce a gas. And you can put the balloon on a bottle and over time, you can do a time-lapse video and watch the balloon come up and then inflate. And it's really cool to see that. And then you can ask your kids, how does that apply to baking? Um, so like bread with the holes in it. And if you could say like, if I add more yeast or more sugar, does it change how much gas is produced? So depending on how old the kid is, the questions can get more pointed, but okay. for a little kid, you're just like, whoa, the balloon expanded. What, what was happening there? Um, that's one of them. Um, we also like to freeze baking soda paste okay. um, and then drop vinegar on it. And we do that with food coloring um, so that you um, can celebrate each holiday. So anytime we have a theme, like let's say we'll go back to bugs 
not even a holiday. Um, I have ones that are shaped like little caterpillars. And so okay. that can be part of your lesson with your kid of them playing with science. And they see that, um, again, that the reaction occurs. Um, you also can do a lot with bake, not baking soda, uh, with food coloring, oil and water, because mm -hmm. oil and water do not mix, but food coloring does mix with water. So you can make okay. lava lamps that way. And you can make fireworks in a jar with that. Um, those are ones we've done before. Um, there's just a lot of stuff in your kitchen. I, I have so many. <laughs> well, we'll um, uh, talk about where to find you online at the end of the recording and people can go there to get some other ideas. Um, so as a parent or uh, if you're teaching kids, um, you know, you might not be a science teacher, uh, my question is, how do you um, know how to answer if you don't know how to explain something? Because, you know, kids are always curious. They're always asking, well, how, how, how come this happens the way it does? Um, and then another part of the question would be how or should I correct a child if they have an incorrect understanding of something that might be a scientific explanation? Yeah. So the first part of that being, well, how do you answer it? I think that's a generational difference. Um, okay. I know when I was a kid, my teacher didn't have access to Google really quickly yeah. to look something yeah. up. And our teacher was right. It was just like, okay, my teacher knew that answer. Or the teacher yeah. was like, I'll look it up and I'll tell you tomorrow. Um, my son though, he's five and it is in his nature to just say, let's ask Siri, let's ask Alexa. Yeah. Like yeah. they're used yeah. to that. And so showing your kid or your students that you don't know the answer, I think is a great thing because they yeah. have this misconception that adults came out knowing everything, that they didn't need to practice this information and that we know it all. Um, and I know if you've got a perfectionist little one, they really need to see that you don't know everything, mm -hmm. that adults mm -hmm. collaborate. Even researchers who are experts in something, if you don't know something, you collaborate with someone who does. Um, that's why we have teachers teaching specific subject areas, you know, because that's your subject area. You're not supposed to be an expert of everything. Um, and so I think handling it that way is really important. Look it up together, like watch a video on YouTube together. I have a series on TikTok that um, things my kid asked me on the way to pre-K that I had to look up. So okay. I try to I try to normalize these things that like I don't I don't know you know and I help explain things to the public. So but yeah. I look online all day when I'm looking for things. Um, but in terms of if your child has a wrong an incorrect understanding, that is tricky. So that is something as a parent I have the hardest time with because sometimes my son will say something that just makes no sense at all. Like mm -hmm. let's make popsicles by putting them in the oven and I'll be like, what? And yeah. I just want to correct him. But yeah. if I were to do that in the way that my instant and in my way, my brain wants to, it would really shut him down and he wouldn't yeah. ever learn why I said that he yeah. would hear what I said, but he wouldn't internalize it. But what I do instead in that case, which this really did happen when he was three, he said this, um, I said, let's, let's try it. Like, let's put a silicone tray of water in the oven and see what happens. Let's leave it outside to see what happens. And each time we put it where he said, he's like, that didn't work. And I'm like, yeah, I wonder how are we going to get there? And then we got to the refrigerator, then we got to the freezer and it finally worked. And yeah. he kept tweaking his own mental model instead of me telling him he's wrong and then giving up. Um, and then he's able to apply it in a different way because we were driving and it was raining and it was really cold and it's turned to sleep. And he said, mommy, the water turned into ice. And it's like, yes, like I didn't yeah. have to tell you that where if you memorized something that freezing must be in the freezer, you might not make that connection. But if you built it on your own, you are able to connect it in other areas. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I like how you kind of, he put that into application, right? Once he'd seen the popsicles freeze in the freezer. And, you know, when you get to a kid that's middle school or high school, a lot of the time they think what they, what they have learned maybe online that might not always be correct uh, goes. <laughs> and so it is kind of uh, difficult as the parent or the teacher to kind of, sway them and, and say, hey, well, let's look at it a different way or let's try this other application. So yeah, like you said, it's it's kind of going through the process as well. 
Yeah. And if there is something that, you know, as the teacher or the parent that is obviously wrong, um, you can find a contrasting case that shows it without you being the one that told it. Um, So maybe have them do an experiment that really shows opposite of what they said or a video or something. So it's not you being like, you are wrong. It is them consuming something, tweaking their model, and then they are figuring it out themselves. So how about um, teachers who are teaching more um, general education, like a grade level elementary teacher or somebody who is maybe teaching something different than science and math in middle or high school. So how can um, they incorporate science and math activities? uh, Maybe if they're teaching literacy and reading, how can you combine the two? And what are some specific books that you would point out? Um, So to combine with reading, I would say that is very dependent on the grade level. Um, For smaller kids, you could do, so like, let's say pre-K and kindergarten, you've got like the Very Hungry Caterpillar. That book is about the life cycle. Um, It's not a nonfiction book about it, but it's still something that is tied to it. So you could tie in maybe purchasing some caterpillars and having them watch the life cycle of the butterfly in the classroom going on behind the scenes. And so you are reading, you are also doing the, um, you're doing some science observations Mm -hmm. and then you could do um, where they could do the whole punches through the fruit, the foods that the caterpillar eats and that's counting. And you could say if they ate this and this and this, how many total did they eat Um, and things like that. So you can, you can pull all of it together. It takes some extra effort on the teacher's part, no doubt. Um, it's it's tough to do that. Mm-hmm. And um, it's easier to do if you're at home with your kid, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a lot of the time, you know, schools have some type of a, a unified improvement plan where, you know, and a lot of it's based on the standardized tests, which for certain grades, um, or certain uh, states is only tested science, like in grade 10, for example, in Colorado, we don't have the science test in grade nine. So um, if you are at a school and you are, for example, um, a history teacher, uh, English teacher, or something like that, and you want to um, you know, help the school out with this goal of raising the science test scores, um, are there ideas of how you can do cross-curricular activities if you're teaching something else? Well, I think in terms of the history of science and representation and things like that, you could really do a lot in um, history and social studies with that. Um, And in ELA, your books could be about science or science discoveries. Um, In terms of math, um, I'm thinking like for exponential growth, you could talk about it in terms of bacteria. Um, you could, you can find some settings that, I mean, we use math and science all the time. So you could apply those to science and put those contexts in math as well. Mm -hmm. Um, working with a teacher at the same grade level, like, Hey, I am doing, these are the concepts I use. What could I use concept wise? Like work with your scientist in your department and talk about how could we do this together. I think Mm -hmm. that the cross collaboration is really important, um, especially because the content specificity of some things um, like misconceptions that can come about. I remember I was on a team with an ELA group and they had written a passage about um, a nuclear power plant um, and they had a misconception that fish would be deformed, kind of like the Simpsons, the three eyed fish at the beginning. (laughs) And that's a misconception. Um, They would just heat the water a little bit. It doesn't actually like leak nuclear stuff into the water. And so without having a scientist there, you can have some misconceptions pop out and you don't want to further those. So working with the scientists, like everybody sit down and talk about how could we do a project together that really furthers all of our goals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's always a great way to go. And I've worked in a school that has cross-curricular collaboration. It just kind of sometimes depends on the scheduling, right? If you're a secondary teacher and you have a planning period at the same time as those teachers that you want to do that collaboration with. So 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about STEM. Um, so how old, in your opinion, do kids need to be to learn about STEM concepts? Um, and could we teach them even in pre-K? Yes, I think you can in pre-K. Um, I think you can even before pre-K, because if okay. you think about it, your gosh, how old is a kid who starts eating in a high chair? Like a year old ish, like yeah, it, it depends. Um, those kids are learning about gravity when they're throwing the food down and throwing their spoons and things. That is not because they're having fun doing it. It's because they're like, hmm, I dropped my spoon and it did that. Now let me try dropping my fork. Did that do yeah. that too? Or is it just the spoon? Um, and so they're learning about the world around them, which is governed by science content concepts, you can definitely start like letting them watch sciencey cartoons when they get of a certain age. They can read science books, read science books to them. Because being a scientist isn't just science. Um, it's asking questions. It is um, designing an experiment to see if this works. And there are all these skills that go along with it, looking for patterns. Um, just like math, counting patterns, there's, it's not just algebra. Um, mm -hmm. And so these are things that you can do with kids for sure. Um, have them sort their toys by color. Um, that is a skill that helps get you ready for science and math. And I, I think you can do these things very early. I like to say from birth, but you, I mean, that little newborn isn't really getting much from it. <laughs> Yeah, and um, I wanted to talk a little bit about your book and kind of uh, walk me through the process of writing it and uh, publishing and, um, you know, you wrote it um, when your son was a little bit younger and um, you said when, when it came out, your son, um, kind of tell me about how you got the ideas for it and yeah. just kind of how, how everything came about. <laughs> so in my day job, I write standardized assessment and curricular materials, and I was reading something about the classification of matter chart that is in college textbooks for chemistry. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking while my son was playing and I was like, he sorts his toys and he's one. I think we sort in chemistry too. It's okay. atoms or molecules, solids or liquid, liquid or gas. And you can classify things like that. And I thought if they've got these skills, and they know that liquids are wet when you touch them and they know that solids are something they can pick up. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I could write a book that has those classifications at, for the younger kids. And so he was, I think he was about one when I started writing it and the illustrations are of the two to three-year-olds in it. Okay. Um, and when it came out, he was like, who is this? Because he's <laughs> three now and it didn't look as much like him because yeah. he changed a little. And now when he looks at it, he, he knows it's baby Charlie, but he, he still <laughs> like takes him a second. Um, but so the book, I have them use their toys and I use real toys. So it'd be like a doll, <laughs> a juice box and it's which, what is different about these? It's that mm -hmm. game from when we were kids, which of these is not like the other and why? And that's the part that you can answer anything. In the book, they could say these three are red and that one's blue, that's fine. As long as you're giving a reason for why you said it. Um, and the book actually evolved from reading it in a classroom because some of the kids were having trouble with what a solid was and I was like, okay, let's think about this. And I was like, oh, if we stomp our feet on the ground. And so like yeah. I started pulling features in. Um, and then I thought about how kids think about what's the same and what's different, like what kind of conversation might spark that. So they actually helped change the book while it was being drafted. Um, but yeah, so it, the book got published and then the pandemic hit and we couldn't go to bookstores because they were all closed. <laughs> and yeah. so we had a massive online push of where we just started sharing experiments that we were doing at home. And it turned into a thing of where people really like learning about science. Um, and so let's learn about science came about of where I share experiments that you can do at home. And parents really liked the the realness of it, of where like you can make mistakes. It's things they can yeah. find at home. Um, 
but yeah, it was a blessing for us too, because it gave me something to do during the pandemic that wasn't focusing on the pandemic and that I wasn't working and I was with my son all the time. And, um, it was something to help us have more structured days, um, and have for more fun during all of this. And are you thinking of any follow-up books to that or? Yeah, um, I, I actually, the website is Let's Learn About Science because I had a few ideas. So this one's about chemistry. I have an okay. idea for biology, one for physics. I have a few ideas. It's just the process of writing a book takes some time. Sure, um, sure. <laughs> yeah, and I've got an activity book um, that I actually have up on my screen right now that I'm working on too. So um, I definitely have a few ideas. Okay, great, great. So um, out of everything we talked about in terms of just learning science um, at the younger ages, uh, science uh, tools in the home, and how you can answer, you know, curious questions from your kids, uh, out of all these things, what's one thing you'd like listeners to remember? Um, that science doesn't have to have fancy chemicals to be done in your house, and that it's okay to make mistakes. Um, I accidentally add too much baking soda all the time and it sprays up in yeah. my face and my son thinks it's hilarious. So yeah. um, it's rolling with the punches, like just that it's, even scientists make mistakes. They just don't publish their mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. Where can people connect with you and find you online? Yeah, so I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok as at Let's Learn About Science sure to put that in there um, in the show notes. Well, thank you so much for being on the Out of the Trenches podcast today. It was a pleasure having you on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.